Welcome back to part three of the executive branch and the presidency. I hope you found uh, parts one and two helpful. If you've uh, checked in on those and watched the uh, roles and powers of the president, that's a really great one. Uh, and then part two, looking at the Electoral College. Uh, so I hope you found those helpful. Today we're going to look at all the president's staff. Who helps the president uh, is the question that we're answering here. Who helps the president in all of these various capacities for two million plus people working in the bureaucracy and then two million contractors beyond that? Who really helps the president. We're going to look at that here in part three. And then don't forget to check out part four, checks on the president and the expansion of presidential power. How does the president communicate uh, the power of the bully pulpit, all of that stuff, some good stuff there in part four. So do check that out. So let's talk about this for a moment. Who helps the president in terms of executing the laws? Well, it's the executive office of the president. It's the White House staff, and it's essentially the cabinet, which includes the departments and agencies and all of the uh, parts of the bureaucracy that we'll talk about in the next chapter uh, in looking at that. So uh, what we see here is the executive office of the president is essentially those uh, that work with the president in some capacity. Uh, the, the heads of these agencies uh, would need to be confirmed by the Senate, and they include things like the Office of Management and Budget, uh, the people that are going to propose the president's budget. They work in the old executive office building, uh, just just a parking lot away from the White House uh, in that big gray building next to the White House, if you've ever seen it. Um, the uh, people that work in the executive residence are included in the executive office of the president uh, in terms of that capacity. Uh, the uh, people that work in the uh, Council of Economic Advisors, how do we create jobs? Uh, how do we come up with an economic policy or plan and make sure that it's carried out? They work in the executive office of the president. And all of these um, uh, various uh, aspects of of Trade representatives and National Security Council, uh, the uh, uh, National Drug Policy uh, is is part of this role of the Executive Office of the President uh, in terms of the uh, the roles that are played there. Office of Management and the Budget is probably the most important, which is why I mentioned it first, uh, because uh, the President does have to submit a budget to Congress, and uh, usually they will gut it and and create their own. Uh, but it does kind of show the policy priorities of the President. What does the president think is most important in terms of uh, where money should flow? Uh, and um, and so the OMB uh, will work on this to uh, create this for the president, to share this with the president, and then uh, to basically finalize it and send it off to Washington, usually uh, to send it off to the Capitol, excuse me, uh, usually uh, by late January or early February in terms of uh, being able to carry that out. Uh, but we also see in the executive office includes things like the CIA. I'd tell you more, but then I'd have to kill you, right? Uh, the Council of Economic Advisors, again, jobs, jobs, jobs. OPM, uh, who declares that in a snow emergency that the federal government is closed? It's the Office of Personnel Management. They're also the ones that do the background checks uh, for security clearances and that sort of thing. And then who's going to work out those executive agreements for trade, those trade agreements we talk about all the time? It's the Office of the uh, Trade Representative, the USTR. Um, they're going to carry out uh, the mission of the executive office of the president in order to carry out the president's agenda in those particular particular areas and aspects. Now, White House staff are people like advisors to the president, the, the chief aides, um, counselors, uh, the, those who work uh, it, with the press, the press secretary, for instance, um, and, and who work underneath the press secretary or the communications um, liaisons. These are all White House staff, and these are uh, essentially the closest to the president in physical proximity uh, because they actually work in the West Wing of the White House, uh, which is where the Oval Office is located. You can see it on the map here, uh, the Cabinet Room. Uh, you can see the Roosevelt Room uh, in terms of uh, where some um, bills are signed from time to time. And then uh, you got the Vice President over here near the National Security Advisor, the Chief of Staff, uh, which uh, the President-elect uh, uh, Joe Biden has, has named Ron Klain to be in that role. And then you can see other advisors. So this is White House staff. These are people that, that serve at the pleasure of the president. They don't require Senate confirmation. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, they would serve uh, the president on a daily basis, uh, probably um, seeing the president multiple times a day uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, resetting and setting and resetting their agendas um, based on what the president wants them to do. Uh, you see the press briefing room here in terms of where the president uh, would go to speak speak uh, and, and talk to the press and that sort of thing. Uh, all of this is, again, proximity is power. So if you're close to the president, you're a pretty influential person in terms of the role that you play within the White House, within the president's agenda. Um, and we see uh, right now the chief of staff is Mark Meadows uh, under the Trump administration, press secretary Kayleigh McEnany, um, and both of these individuals um, 
have uh, have served uh, uh, not the entire term. Uh, they are uh, probably a little, yeah, I think uh, McEnany is a little less than a year. Mark Meadows, uh, probably what, four, five, six months at most uh, that has served in that capacity. And um, and so uh, they are the, the voice, the, the megaphone for the president. They go out and speak uh, to the press in the, the press briefing room or outside the White House um, on, behalf of the, on behalf of the president in terms of trying to set the agenda, trying to set the record straight, so to speak, uh, in terms of that. And so very important roles that they play as part of those White House staff. And again, they're serving uh, in this capacity. Any, anybody in the White House staff is usually has good access to the press, not being uh, too far away from the press there in the uh, uh, press corps office and that sort of thing. Um, so that uh, that is the role that they play in the White House staff. Now let's talk about the cabinet for a moment. Uh, the cabinet here, um, the um, the idea here was n not that the founders and framers really envisioned um, the cabinet per se, but really advisors, people um, not in uh, uh, not in the Constitution as outlined as a cabinet uh, as a whole, uh, but they would be confirmed by the Senate if there were advisors uh, that the that the president needed uh, that they would serve at the pleasure of the president. They could be fired at any time, uh, but uh, that they would be confirmed by the Senate to serve in this type of a a close presidential role. Now we see 14 cabinet secretaries today in in uh, in departments like Department of Defense. Uh, we have a Secretary of Defense. We have a, a Department of Transportation overseeing highways uh, for the um, the Secretary of, of Transportation. We have the Department of the Interior, which handles like uh, our nation's parks, uh, and and this is the Secretary of the Interior that would would oversee that. And then we have the Attorney General, uh, so uh, which oversees the Department of Justice, and that's the only one that isn't a Secretary of kind of situation. Now um, these can be very large organizations that they're overseeing. They kind of had split allegiances because they serve at the pleasure of the president and they are loyal to the president's agenda, but they can also see where the agencies are coming from and what the agencies need because they're seeing and hearing and working with these people on a daily basis. They're going down to the White House um, to hear the president or to talk with the president, but a lot of times they're hearing more from the agency they're working in, from the department that they're, they're working in uh, the actual offices and rooms and talking with their staffs on a on an hourly basis uh, in terms of those those people there. Now this is the cabinet room. Uh, the president does meet uh, often uh, with advisors of the cabinet in terms of um, in terms of of doing this. We we kind of see it play out in terms of press moments more so than than actually um, actually you know the president gets together to to kind of uh, his brain trust to kind of uh, feel things out. Uh, that doesn't happen as much with with the cabinet as it does with White House staff. Um, you're going to see more of that take place in the Oval Office that did under the Obama and Bush administrations as well. Uh, so uh, when we see, oh, the president's getting the cabinet together, uh, that's more of a formal role. We don't see as much uh, brainstorming going on uh, in, in terms of how that plays out. Uh, you can pause the video here and take a look. Uh, I pulled this uh, from one of the books uh, in terms of uh, when these different cabinet departments took shape. Uh, some of them go back to 1789, State and Treasury in particular. Uh, then you see um, Homeland Security being the most recent, uh, it being established uh, by Congress. Remember, the president doesn't establish a new cabinet department. It is actually Congress that does that. Uh, the president can propose one, and the Bush administration did after 9-11 happened in 2001. Homeland Security was created uh, in 2002 um, because of the response to terrorism after the 9-11 attacks uh, that we saw there. So um, this kind of talks about the functions of each as well as um, uh, when they were created and kind of what they do, which is always interesting to see their various roles in in terms of, of where they played. Uh, notice we didn't have a Department of Agriculture until 1862. It wasn't until after the Civil War uh, that the uh, Department of Agriculture uh, became important enough to actually have a cabinet department focused on it. Um, Meanwhile, we didn't have a Justice Department uh, looking at uh, at defending the government until 1870. Uh, so, um, and then uh, the uh, the Army and and Navy and War Departments essentially became the Department of Defense in 1947 after World War II. Uh, but it's kind of interesting to see how that all plays out. Um, so uh, why would the president maybe have some trouble 
in terms of controlling uh, their their secretaries, uh, secretaries at these uh, at these departments. And again, like I said, it's because of split allegiances. Uh, many of the staff that they're working with on a daily basis have much more knowledge of the agency or the department themselves. They have much more knowledge of how the the agency is working, what works, what isn't. And the president is looking at it from a bigger picture point of view. Uh, they're getting the uh, boots on the ground kind of situation as to what's actually happening in the department, in the agency, and what's happening uh, in this and what, what's happening in real life, right? The IRL, what's happening in real life uh, in these situations? And uh, what should the president do about it? Uh, what should the agency do about it? So that's where there are split allegiances, and and their job is is to kind of serve as a liaison between the president and the agency uh, to bring to the president the things uh, that that uh, align with the president's agenda, but things that can be changed on behalf of uh, of the agency, as well as taking to the agency the agenda, the priorities that the president has, and why the agency should work to implement them. So we see a lot of that playing out there in terms of uh, the roles uh, that are. Played. Now we also have what's called an inner cabinet, and this is kind of the uh, the president's uh, kitchen cabinet, if you will, um, the the uh, the uh, inner line of defense. Uh, and this is made up of usually the attorney general, the secretary of state, secretary of defense, and treasury. Uh, and we can see these gentlemen are serving in these roles right now. Um, we have William Barr uh, serving as Attorney General, uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, uh, Secretary of Defense, and this just changed. Mark Esper was fired uh, yesterday, and so um, that uh, he is no longer, but we wish him well. And then Secretary of Treasury is Steve Mnuchin, and uh, these are really uh, because of the role that they play in government on a daily basis. I mean, you're talking about um, the attorney general dealing with um, defending uh, the government and taking action on government actions uh, to make sure the rule of law is followed. Uh, Secretary of State in dealing with other nations. You have the Secretary of Defense, our military readiness, and then Treasury, you can't do anything without money. Uh, so really, you can see why this is the inner cabinet of the president's cabinet and the importance that it plays because of, of, the, um, of the, the vast expanse of, of coverage coverage uh, that they have in terms of carrying out the president's agenda and carrying out the business of the people of the American government. Uh, so that is a very important role there. Um, I will mention here uh, that the first lady doesn't have an official position. She doesn't get paid for the role uh, that she is in as first lady, as FLOTUS, first lady of the United States. Uh, but many times they take on a, a, a more charitable uh, aspect, a more charitable role. Um, we saw um, Laura Bush during the Bush administration, really focus on helping at-risk boys. Uh, the really important there, the importance of, of helping at-risk youth, and particularly focus on uh, inner city um, males in terms of um, helping them to get a fresh start and a, and a, and a leg up. Uh, we saw the uh, during the Obama years, we saw Michelle Obama focus on childhood obesity. Hillary Clinton focused on health care. Uh, we saw Melania Trump focus on cyberbullying uh, and um, and the uh, the focus of on uh, being best uh, there was was part of that role. Uh, but the first ladies don't have a official government position. They are not government employees. Uh, they are. Um, they're, they serve in important roles, and they definitely have a megaphone in terms of uh, getting their messages out there to the press uh, when they talk. Uh, press do pay attention, uh, but it is a much more muted role than the, when the president gets up to speak, so to, so to, so to speak, uh, in terms of those aspects. Okay, so let's talk about the, uh, the bureaucracy as a whole. It's kind of divided into four different um, aspects of the, of the bureaucracy, and we'll talk much more detail about these when we get to um, uh, the next chapter on the bureaucracy. But essentially, we have the cabinet departments. These are the ones uh, that serve in the cabinet, secretary of defense, of justice, of state. Um, that's the cabinet roles. Those are um, politically appointed and the heads of those uh, agencies, uh, many civil service, by the way, serving in those uh, departments, but the heads of those departments are appointed and approved by, appointed by the president, approved, uh, confirmed by the Senate. Uh, we see the same is true for independent executive agencies. These are agencies that kind of do their own thing. They're very independent uh, in uh, in that respect. NASA doesn't focus on Treasury. Uh, National Archives doesn't focus on science. Um, very uh, very siloed in terms of their their approach and and their role that they play there. Uh, we have independent regulatory commissions, uh, which basically are governing bodies that enforce the law. Uh, by many times uh, making
making sure people are doing the right thing, keeping the honest people honest. And if they're not honest, then uh, then then checking their power to make sure that they um, are either slapped with fines or regulatory punishments. Um, and uh, and these are roles uh, that are appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate. And these are the only um, roles that can't be fired by the president just because. Uh, they can't be fired at the pleasure of the president. Has to be for cause. Uh, so any of the others can be fired at, at any time uh, on behalf of the, the president. If the president wants to fire somebody who's in charge, they can do so. Uh, you can't do that with a regulatory commission. There needs to be cause in order to let that person, the head of that person go. And that's to keep uh, the political aspects uh, of the job out of it. Uh, if you're, if you're, um, if you're looking into a company uh, that is a big donor of the president, uh, you don't want there to be a political decision made there uh, that could negatively impact the president in the eyes of the press or the eyes of the American people. So regulatory commissions uh, do have a little more insulation there uh, from the president's whims in terms of being fired and that sort of thing. And then we have government corporations. Uh, the idea that uh, these are uh, agencies like the Postal Service and Amtrak that basically run like a business. Uh, they charge for their services. Services, but they are also uh, funded by the government and they're owned by the government. Uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority, the TVA, provides electricity uh, in the uh, Appalachian Mountains uh, to many homes that otherwise without the Tennessee Valley Authority would have never had electricity. Uh, and, and, uh, and so these government corporations uh, are, are filling a void uh, that... Um, that most corporations don't step up to fill. Uh, we've seen some of that in the postal space, of course, with FedEx and UPS and other agencies. Uh, but on a daily basis, in terms of regular mail, uh, the U.S. Postal Service still is the dominant factor there. Even even Amazon would tell you that. Um, and so that's the uh, the role that they play. So uh, some independent agencies, again, executive agencies. Uh, the idea that we see here um, is that um, they can be removed at any time. Independent agencies. Um, the uh, the role here is that they are in fixed terms. They can only be removed for cause. That's the independent regulatory aspects. And then judges serve for life. So there's really not a whole lot um, that the president could do once they appoint a person uh, and they are confirmed by the Senate. Now let's talk, uh, speaking of Senate and Congress, let's talk about legislative liaisons for a moment. Uh, the president appoints and or assigns legislative liaisons. They work in the executive office of the president, but uh, they are basically lobbyists uh, They for the president. They go up to Capitol Hill. They serve on the president's behalf and they talk to members of Congress, senators, uh, Senate staff, uh, congressional staff, and they try and push their agenda. Uh, who can they get to sponsor bills to support the president's agenda and to really uh, move forward and carry it out? And so uh, that really is uh, the role that they play there in terms of trying to uh, to address that. Uh, one last item we'll talk more about uh, when we when we um, when we get to part four. Uh, but this is about approval ratings. Uh, Presidents always say they don't look at polls, but the first thing they look at is polls, okay? Uh, when you're running a race uh, for president, one of the first things you're looking at is Iowa and New Hampshire. Uh, I'm looking at polls. Uh, what's most important here? How do I um, make sure that I... Uh, I'm, I'm doing well in the polls, and if I'm not, then how can I fix that? Notice George W. Bush. Um, during uh, George W. Bush era, uh, presidential polls, very important after uh, the Persian Gulf crisis, but then the economy tanked, and then all of a sudden uh, the approval rating tanked along with it. Uh, we see this um, in terms of the role that, um, that presidents play, and it sometimes impacts the agenda. Uh, in terms of the uh, the agenda and the role uh, that the president issues for for priorities that they have based on their approval ratings in many cases. Now we hope that that doesn't uh, really ram the agenda through in terms of oh I'm doing this to get uh, the popularity of the of the voters. Uh, but you can't look at it and say uh, that that presidents uh, there's a honeymoon period at the beginning where people really love you and then they don't love you so much. Uh, and even Reagan experienced this. Uh, look at. Carl Carter, uh, at the beginning of the Carter administration, and you can see how far uh, the Carter fell uh, until he was um, uh, until he was he was essentially removed by election, uh, and, and Reagan won the electoral college in 1980. Uh, Reagan, very popular, uh, but it, uh, after um, the economy was tanking in 1981, it really wasn't until about 1982 um, and three that that it really uh, kind of picked up, and even then uh, he hit his peak after. Um, 
after we saw the the economy recovering and then all of a sudden it's what have you done for me lately so uh, presidents have that honeymoon period and then they are very much in a what have you done for me lately uh, type of uh, mentality where they're trying to uh, appease the people with um, whatever they can uh, in order to carry out uh, what the people want and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't as we see here and sometimes that has a positive impact on their re-election and sometimes not all right, so this ends part three of uh, the who helps the president in terms of looking at the different agencies, uh, the different commissions, and the different corporations of the president. Remember, proximity is power, uh, and those that are closest to the president uh, serving in White House staff uh, really have the president's ear. They can have a significant impact in terms of the role that they can play in getting the president uh, to carry out his agenda and prioritize uh, the things that they feel are, are important, and especially... Uh, uh, in, in that capacity when they're trying to get things done. All right, so this is all the president's staff. Who helps the president? I hope you found this helpful. Don't forget to check out part four. We're looking at checks on the president, the expansion of presidential power, and the use of different communications tools in terms of carrying out the president's agenda. Have a great day. We'll see you in part four.